Hi, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Nonprofit Spotlight. As you know, a Nonprofit Spotlight is a production of the Volunteer Advisory Committee here at Community Television. And every program, we highlight a nonprofit in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County, doing wonderful work. And we are delighted, uh, this program, to be highlighting the ACLU of Northern California, Santa Cruz County chapter. And we are extremely happy to have with us Lee Brokaw, who's a board member and the chairman of the Police Transparency and Accountability Committee. Lee, welcome. Thank you, Steve. Glad to be here. Yeah, have, we're glad to have you. Just as a little background, uh, the uh, ACLU uh, of uh, Santa Cruz County has a rich history of, uh, of doing a lot of uh, civil liberties work. Uh, the chapter has twice won the Dick Criley Activism Award, which is annually given to one of the 23 regional chapters for outstanding work in the area of civil liberties. And our chapter, and uh, really through the excellent efforts of uh, of our board members and Lee you in particular uh, have uh, persuaded our city council to pass an ordinance which has banned both facial recognition and uh, predictive policing technologies so the 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 uh, chapter has a wonderful uh, past and really near present history of doing uh, excellent uh, civil liberties work uh, in Santa Cruz Lee uh, for people who don't know you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and how you you came to work with uh, the board of the ACLU here in Santa Cruz County? Well, actually, we probably met at uh, Veterans for Peace Thanksgiving dinner and uh, worked together on that. And um, I, I tend to talk civil liberties talk whether <laughs> I belong to the ACLU or not. And you invited me to join the board. And I was extremely flattered and pleased to be accepted by the group. And um, I have a, a history that goes way back to Berkeley in the late 60s, early 70s of being an activist and um, actually being, uh, being tear gassed from a helicopter with experimental tear gas, powdered tear gas that oh. Ed Meese was dropping on students to see if it was good enough to be used in Vietnam. I'll be done. So, um, uh, in between those experiences, I went out and became a contractor and built a bunch of homes and remodeled a bunch of homes and moved to Santa Cruz. And uh, so when I joined the board, um, the the option to to join the Police Accountability and Transparency Committee was offered and I joined. And by the second year, I took over the chairmanship and we've been putting on forums every year since. And really, uh, some wonderful work. I uh, was telling a little bit about the history, of course. Uh, you've done several different fora uh, on these issues that have been extremely well attended, and they're really informative uh, for the community. Um, right now, um, because police accountability and transparency is really one of our uh, priority issues for the ACLU, you and your fellow committee members uh, are working on uh, yet another form. In fact, we just had one recently that was kind of a step up into this next form you're having. So tell us a little bit about uh, you know the present work you're doing and uh, what you think are your priorities in terms of the committee work that's about to be done. Okay, we, um, we've had two recent forums. The first one was on non-law enforcement response to 911 calls. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a, an advocate for the CAHOOTS program. Don't ask me what CAHOOTS stands for. I don't have it written down in front of me. But it's a non-law enforcement response to 911 that was, uh, oh, 20 plus years old up in Eugene, Oregon. And um, they have uh, worked cooperatively with cooperatively with the police department up there. And um, I think the last year we have statistics on them in Eugene, they answered something like 17,000 calls. I think they needed police backup 300 times. And, um, and they saved the city about $1.8 million. Um, a CAHOOT style program is in effect around the country in multiple cities, locally, uh, Ronert Park, uh, uh, Oakland has a variant, uh, San Francisco has a variant, Huntington Beach has a variant, everybody does their own way. Um, the way it works is typically you have a sprinter van or something like that 
that is outfitted uh, for an EMT to be able to give first aid on site. Um, say somebody calls in to 911 and there's somebody sleeping or passed out on the sidewalk. Um, that's not really a law enforcement issue, but the way things are handled today, it is a law enforcement issue, which means you get a fire engine dispatched, uh, ambulance dispatched, and one or two or three police cars dispatched. And um, they wake the guy up and take him to the emergency room because they don't know what else to do. Um, our approach would be to have a crisis counselor with the EMT in the van and they'd wake the person up and uh, ask them if they're all right, offer them some coffee, help them sober up, um, take them to a sobering house or if they were all right where they were, um, make sure that medically they're fit and um, leave them alone mm -hmm. um, and move on to the next call. Um, there are calls like, uh, neighbor notices that grandma across the street left her front door open and all the lights are out and we all know she's kind of forgetful and uh, maybe she forgot to lock her front door. Well, there's no need for a police, a fire engine, an ambulance to show up on a call like that. A cahoots call could very quietly without sirens, without waking up the neighbors could show up and knock on the door and, uh, ask if the lady's all right, wake her up and uh, tell her her children are concerned about her. Um, so what we want to do is, is <clears throat> we want to do actually what Andy Mills suggested, our soon to be uh, gone police chief, is take these calls away from us. Mm -hmm. We don't, we're not equipped to deal with this. Um, you don't need a gun or handcuffs or mace or a bulletproof vest to answer these calls. And it's a lot more humane for the individual to be approached by two civilians. Now, my ideal would be that they'd arrive on a skateboard. Uh, <laughs> that, that the third person would follow up with the van, but uh, the, the, the cahoot style people would be just like the people in the street, arrive on a bicycle. Yeah. Um, and, and there isn't the intimidation of the flashing lights and the, the glint off the badge and all the squeak of the leather holster and all that sort of stuff that's very off-putting to people, particularly if they're in crisis. And uh, right now uh, we have uh, siloed mental health um, agencies that um, have vans, Mert and Murdy, and I don't know enough about them to call them out, but I'm, I'm just saying that what we have are agencies that claim that they're doing much of what we want to do, and we agree. Um, they go home at five o'clock. Um, they don't operate on the weekends. And we want 24-7, 365 or 6, um, we want to be available to the community um, so that uh, we can save the fire trucks for fires and save the ambulance for when you really have a car accident or something. Or as in my case, when my pacemaker stopped and my heart stopped and I needed to have paramedics come to my house and... Um, they saved my life, you know, and I was very happy to have those guys show up. Um, but I, I just, I, I, it's interesting, Steve, I, I have a couple of strange projects that I do. One of them is, uh, on a yearly basis, I cut out letters to the editor in the Sentinel and I add them up chronologically. And just this morning I was cutting out May 1st, 2001 and a letter to the editor from me. Why can't the council find money for cahoots? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And, a, profit, um, a profit at his own time. Okay. It was it, it the, the, the problem we have with the city council, um, amongst many, is that they are unwilling to even fund a study by Ben Adams Clymer, former uh, member of the Coots team up in Eugene. He gave him a budget of $38,000 to put together an entire proposal, how much money for salary, what do you have to put away for workman's comp and taxes, and what's the van going to cost, and how much you're going to have to spend to put supplies in the van, what are you going to pay for the counselor and for the EMT. Um, and the council couldn't even find that amount of money, but they're – They've, they found money for all kinds of other things that weren't in the budget, um, but we couldn't get the first base 
with the council. And so we have, uh, we pivoted to the board of supervisors. This should be a countywide program. Yeah. Well, it, you know, the, you, you touched upon it. Uh, the CAHOOTS approach is a multi-agency approach. And so you need, uh, you know, police, fire, mental behavioral health. What has been, in your view, what's been the response of our local police, fire, mental behavioral health professionals in terms of really trying to push forward with the 911 alternative response such as CAHOOTS might provide? Well, I, I had incredibly favorable response from Andy Mills, chief of Santa Cruz Police. Um, um, Terry McManus of Capitola retired before I had a chance to get down and talk to him, but I have talked to his replacement and he is open to conversation. Um, I don't get down to Watsonville much and Chief Honda, who, whom I thought would be very favorable, um, and I'm told was favorable, but he's retired. So within the context of the police, we've got a lot of turmoil right now. Yeah, very fluid situation, absolutely. And very fluid, and in in uh, Santa Cruz, we got a fluid city uh, city manager situation. So the powers that can make decisions um, are are not um, that approachable right now because everybody's kind of going, well, wait till we get a city manager, wait till we get a new police chief. So we have taken to following a program that's called the Roadmap to Mental Health. Um, and what the gentleman who produced that document suggests, and we met with him, is stop working with the decision makers and go to the community. And uh, the community is totally in favor of having a hospital where you can go to when you have a heart attack or a broken leg. And I doubt that there's anybody in the community who would say, we don't want to fund a place for people to go who are having a mental health crisis. I think everybody is in favor of taking care of people's health needs and mental health is the same kind of need as if you had diabetes or heart condition. It's just another condition of the human body. And right now, we're very short of beds for uh, mental health. Uh, you ask about people in the mental health community. Uh, Carol Williamson, who's the president of NAMI, um, has been our, uh, uh, one of our members. Uh, Kirsten Carraway, uh, president of the Monterey Bay Area Psych Association, is one of our members. And uh, we, we have a lot of support um from the mental health community through just those two individuals um we just met recently met with uh, uh katrina lisma who teaches psychiatric nursing at cabrillo college and prepares those students to go out into the real world she's totally familiar with cahoots absolutely thrilled and excited to be on our committee so we feel like within the the professional community we've got a lot of support yeah. Um, so well, you're certainly talking to the uh, to the right people in terms of the policymakers and the gatekeepers, the people who are going to really flesh this out at some point with both support and services. Uh, you said that uh, the lack of response from city council has uh, prompted you to pivot a bit to the Board of Supervisors. Of course, now you understand that Ryan Coonerty is retiring, so the Board of Supervisors, the composition of that is going to change a, a, a little bit at least. Yeah. Um, what, do, what do you expect in terms of uh, cooperation and response from the Board of Supervisors, either present or, or future? Well, um, we've pivoted away from them as well. Uh, we really ran up against a stone wall. We couldn't even, I'm going to, I'm going to get a couple of things mixed up here because I've got another committee that maybe I should introduce at this point because both committees are doing much the same activism with respect to the decision makers. Of course. And that came out of a, a forum that we held earlier this year on AB 1185, which is sheriff's oversight. It's a law that was passed, signed into law. It's been on the books for a year. And it gives the Board of Supervisors the opportunity um, to form an oversight committee and uh, an inspector general to look into how the sheriff is uh, operating the jail uh, or operating his field officers. 
or protecting the people in the course, all the things that the sheriff does. And we couldn't even get a study session from the Board of Supervisors. They weren't interested. Um, Sheriff Hart is telling them that everything's okay. Uh, even though we have people dying in the jail, we have people having sex in the jail, we have overdoses in the jail. We went with that kind of list of things to the Board of Supervisors and and we couldn't we couldn't get a hearing. We we couldn't get on the agenda. And um, that group is looking to the community to build allies. Um, we would like to, uh, well, we don't want to do the heavy work of a, of a ballot initiative uh, countywide, but it, it, the mission is so important that law enforcement have outside civilian oversight. It's just, it's the obvious thing to do unless you're in law enforcement, then it becomes uh, optional or no, 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 no. I don't need that. Um, it's just for, I know you're about to say something. No, uh, of course. No. As, as comparison, there's a lady in San Mateo County who has formed a committee uh, who's doing much what we're doing. And um, I recently published with my little blast that I send out daily an article uh, where the sheriff of San Mateo County said, end quote, I don't really need this, but if the people want it, I will work with them. We don't have that spirit of cooperation in Santa Cruz County. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of concern, uh, not only in the community, but uh, much discussion on our board about the current and past administration of the jail, uh, the lack of oversight in terms of uh, really having ombudsman or somebody to come in and take a look at the policies and procedures that really have resulted in jail deaths and overdoses and the things that uh, really have made our jail system uh, onerous in, in all its operation and respects. Yeah. Yeah, we, the grand jury report on the jail um, had a quote that I'm not sure I'm going to get right, but something to the extent of you can tell what kind of a civilization you have by looking at your jails. How, when you have somebody in custody, that there, there's a noun that goes with that. Who is the custodian? And if you are a custodian of a fellow citizen, be they innocent or guilty, they're still a citizen. And as a community, we are required morally to make sure that that person is not harmed while they are under our charge. Right. And I'm afraid that, that the, the attitude in America for a long time is, lock them up and throw away the key. And now my neighborhood is safe. I don't have to think about it. And I think that the ACLU and, and other types of people are, um, are concerned and, and feel like that there's more to be done than throw away the key. And as you and I both know, our, our local grand jury is mandated to publish two two reports annually uh, reviewing operations of the, the jail. And uh, although it does highlight uh, some abuses and some uh, mismanagement, uh, perhaps, of the jail system itself, it doesn't really provide a mechanism for any oversight, any real impact on how that jail is run, particularly by citizens who are concerned that their local jail uh, may be acting in a way that doesn't reflect our community values. Well, I'm not an expert on civil grand juries, as opposed, and nor am I even better equipped to talk about a criminal grand jury. But I have watched the grand jury's report on the way the city council was run during the recall. And I have read this, the grand jury with respect to the jail. And in both cases, the responsible authorities basically blew off the grand jury, uh, gave a, almost a form letter um, response. Thank you very much. Go away. Um, and um, it, it had no impact. The, there is no um, enforcement aspect to a uh, civil grand jury report. And... Um, 
and I think that's that, that's bigger than the ACLU. I, I I think you need to have the judges in town um, make it known to the people who are decision makers that uh, a report from the citizens, such as a grand jury report, is not a trivial matter, and uh, it it needs respect and it needs response and not a, 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 a pro forma canned response. It needs action. So, and as you mentioned, you know, the, the, uh, sheriff's oversight is now, um, provided by, by statute. Uh, we can go ahead and, and try to get this, uh, uh, organized and created, uh, either by cooperation, as you mentioned, from the board of supervisors, which does not seem to be forthcoming or through a ballot initiative, which uh, we all know it takes a lot of pick and cover work and uh, a lot of time and energy. Um, how do you think this is going to shake out as we move forward, not only as the ACLU, but, always, but also as a community, in terms of, of actually envisioning or creating sheriff's oversight in the next, in the next year, say? Well, we're aiming at 2024, putting a ballot initiative on uh, the ballot in 2024. That gives us the opportunity to see some new people on, on the Board of Supervisors. Hopefully we'll have somebody such as Justin Cummings with his, um, with his experience. He helped uh, um, uh, guide the facial recognition band and the band of predictive policing. He helped guide that through the city council in cooperation with the police chief and the ACLU. And he has that kind of experience, which would be a real uh, asset to the Board of Supervisors with respect to this particular subject. Um, I think there are, uh, I, I don't know the politics. I've, I've heard there are other people who might be leaving uh, and there'd be opportunities for new people on, on the board. The board is in fact responsible for the jails as it is. The sheriff works for the people and he is responsible to the Board of Supervisors who grants him money to run his jail. So we elect him, he works for us, um, but we don't have the purse strings. And so the Board of Supervisors are his immediate supervisor by virtue of, of the budget that they set for him. And they seem to think everything's okay. We disagree. Yeah. It's notably uh, that you mentioned uh, um, our former mayor, uh, he apparently uh, felt that he was persuaded on racial tech, racial uh, on facial technology by the forum that the ACLU and your committee put on a while back. Is that he was a panelist? Uh, he was able to you know, talk right. to people who were familiar with that uh, the, the unreliability. Of, uh, frankly, of that technology. But that's one of the reasons why he was so steadfast and so supportive of the ordinance that was finally passed through city council was a direct result of his participation in that ACLU forum. So it's a, it's a great testament to the work that you and the committee are doing and the board are doing in terms of guiding public policy. Well, when you say it all like that, Sounds like somebody else, not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, the ACLU generally, uh, the persuasive power that they have in terms of the work that you are doing, particularly in uh, police transparency and accountability, I think has shown results in the community. Well, I would certainly like to think so. Um, one, I don't, you've been an activist much longer than I have, and um, I, I find that uh, it can be discouraging. Um, you try so hard, um, but in the words of my friend, Bruce Van Allen, um, you can try really hard to do something and be totally surprised about how something else comes out of it that you weren't expecting. And, um, and that's why he keeps trying and, and that's why I keep trying and I'm sure that's why you keep trying. Um, we, if, if the way I'm built, if I'm going to be a responsible citizen in the community of Santa Cruz, um, I want to advocate for the things that I think mm -hmm. are important. And yeah. I, I, I need to slip in a disclaimer, um, uh, while I am a member of the board, uh, and, a member of the ACLU, uh, 
I am not speaking on behalf of the ACLU. Um, that's something that, that, that we learned the hard way because we need to get permission for every word we say. Well, if we'll make that not speaking for the ACLU. I'm not. Yeah. I'm speaking on, on behalf of, of, of the people on my committee who helped me greatly. And uh, I, I don't do this alone, believe me. Uh, it takes a group. And I've been very fortunate that the people who've been on my committee every year when we get a chance to change committees, the people that work with me have always wanted to continue on. And really, uh, feel free to mention, uh, certainly our chair, Peter Goldblum, is one. Yes, yeah, Peter Goldblum, uh, board chair of the ACLU, is uh, a member of my committee, and, and I... Uh, I always tell him that when the when the board chair is on your committee, it's not really yours. But Lee, I think your actions have disabused anybody of that notion because you certainly are the chair and a strong chair. Um, we have about two minutes left. Uh, great to quote. Uh, well, let me let me give a shout out. Let me give a shout out Please. to Brenda Griffin, Please. president of the NAACP. Um, and Keith Lazar, uh, probably the most uh, senior continuous member of the ACLU board going back decades. And um, we've had a couple of members who have moved on. I, that's, that's the core. It's really a small group of people. Well, it was a wonderful quote uh, from Bruce Van Allen that sometimes your efforts uh, don't yield the results that you thought they were going to, but they yield others that are just as valuable. Um, how do you see the near-term efforts for a Kahoot-style program uh, reaping some benefit uh, within the next year? You're talking about 2024 for the Sheriff's Advisory Committee, but in terms of Kahoots, is there some small uh, progress that you would uh, gladly accept uh, in the near term to you know, validate your efforts? Well, we feel like it needs to be a uh, a countywide organization. Um, and that's a big lift, just like the Sheriff's Oversight. Both of them are county initiatives. But if we could persuade Santa Cruz City or Watsonville um, to do a citywide um, alternate response to 911 calls as a pilot program for a year, um, we would be most pleased to uh, be able to demonstrate to the local community that it actually works. And by the way, the UC system has mandated that all UC campuses will have this program and it very well may occur up at UCSC before any place else in our county. Well, thank you, Lee, uh, for being here. Thanks to the ACLU of Northern California, Santa Cruz County Chapter, of which you're a board member and chair of the Police Accountability and Transparency Committee for doing such great work. Uh, I'm glad that we got an opportunity for this show to highlight that. And that's really what Nonprofit Spotlight is all about. Lee, thanks so much for being here and for all your work. And I've been Steve Plate. Uh, uh, tune in next time for another program on Nonprofit Spotlight. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm.